Hello. My name is Max McEwen. My mother calls me doctor. She's very proud of me. And uh, my specialty is how humans shape their own futures. So that's quite a big topic. I mean, you do important work making beautiful things. Uh, some of you do even less important work telling other people to create beautiful things. But we all have our place in life. And this is the world's best-selling book on strategy, which I, my mother is proud of. I think you should give me a round of applause for that. Yeah, I think that's very good. Th think how pleased she is. And because of that, I will give this copy to one of you people, signed. Who would like this signed copy of a book? Come forward, sir. Come forward. It's excellent. I've also got an innovation book. Somebody, come and have a hug. <laughs> you need a hug. Apparently, you need seven hugs a day to be psychologically healthy. I'm, yeah. I'm up to six now. Or the equivalent. Thank you yeah. very much. Uh, this is a free book. It is not the best-selling book, but it is a book written by me called The Innovation Book. Who would like this signed copy? Can you catch? Can you catch? Try. There we go. Oh, and this is one of only two books called Adaptability in the World. Again, you know, an excellent book. Who would like this copy? Yeah, Yellow Trouser Man. Yellow Trouser Man, well done. Right, I shall introduce myself a little bit more again. My specialty is how humans shape their own futures. That's individuals like you. You're an individual. So even though you look a lot like him, uh, but you're still individual because you have an earring and he doesn't. And how groups shape their futures. So we, we need a little bit of a definition in here because I do real research. And the definition at the moment is strategy is about shaping the future. It is about the shortest route to desirable ends with available means. Very important stuff. That means strategy is not the document that somebody paid a consultancy a lot of money to produce. Strategy is not a document. It is instead your route to desirable ends with available means. And at this point, I should introduce my family. Uh, not all of them, because we go way back to the first humans, uh, everybody in my family. But one of them was my grandfather, who recently died. Oh, Somebody usually laughs at this point for some reason, you know, death. And he is an Irishman. And he used to tell me a joke. He used to say to me, uh, son, I would not start here if I were you. He thought I should start somewhere else. If I started closer to the end, the place I wanted to go, than where I was, that would be much easier. We want strategy that allows us to get some place that we want to go with what we have available. If we cannot go to where we want to with what is available. We need innovation. And innovation is simply defined as new ideas made useful. New ideas is new ideas made useful. And we make those new ideas useful. They don't even have to be that new. We use new ideas when what we have available our existing ideas, our existing means, are insufficient to get us to where we want to go, our desirable ends, or won't get us there fast enough, efficiently enough, cost-effectively enough, profitably enough, beautifully enough, wonderfully enough. We then need new ideas. And how do we get there? Well, just as a pause, I should let you know that I have four children. My eldest is 23. The reason I'm telling you this is that my friends in Japan tell me that it's important to introduce your family to a new audience so that people will like you, even if they like nothing else you say. 
which is why I continue to have children with the same woman. She's been involved throughout uh, these four children. The eldest is Reuben, who's 23, strat uh, history, politics. The next one is my expert in alcohol. He's very important. He knows how to make 500 cocktails in three different languages. And then Bronte, who is my French expert. And then finally, Steinbeck. And when Steinbeck was born, this is Steinbeck. He's nine years old currently. Steinbeck, and uh, here he is, you know, crying. It was quite interesting where, when it happened. You should close your eyes because he was naked where, when he was born. And Steinbeck, um, my first child, I missed the birth of my first child. Second child, uh, I was there. Third child, missed that, my daughter. Uh, and not my fault. Because you know, this, it happens at any stage at all uh, after nine months. So I was involved at the start, missed the end, have been involved in the rest. Steinbeck, when he was, my wife was pregnant with him, we made this choice, I decided to take off time off work and to hire a doctor and a midwife, a nurse. And I took two months off work and I stayed at home working. And I put the children, my other three children, in the attic. And we fed them. But they were in the attic. And uh, the midwife came in, and my wife said, I'm in labor. And the midwife did what they do. She was sort of middle management, really. She had a look at the process. And she said, she declared that this would be some time. Uh, were, she wasn't ready to give birth yet. And she went downstairs and made herself a coffee. Meanwhile, upstairs, the creator, my wife, well, I'm the creator, but she was involved, and uh, she was walking around. She wanted a very natural birth. She was walking around, and she said, I've had three children. I know something about this baby business. This baby is coming now. And the baby did. And I caught the baby uh, like this. We have a little space where we know the baby was born. So Steinbeck was born outside his bedroom. And I caught Steinbeck. And I'm holding Steinbeck like this. He looks a little like this, but sort of covered in afterbirth. And I, I'm sh rocking him like this. To me, he's the most beautiful thing in the world. To me. So he's a beautiful baby. But to anybody else, he's ugly. And a little bit like an idea, he's definitely not finished yet. If you thought your baby was finished, you'd be very disappointed. I mean, they can do nothing. The, the only thing he could do was look a lot like me. He's got a lot more intelligent as he's gone along. Uh, he likes the fact that he was born in our house. Uh, he's always saying as he passes the little point, we, we, he put a, a cross on it at one point. And he'd always say, hashtag, born here. <laughs> um, hashtag, what well, it says, better than Jesus. <laughs> so, did, you know, he's born very proud of himself. N beautiful to me, ugly to other people, definitely not finished yet. And that is a whole lot like ideas. They're beautiful to the people who create them. They are ugly to the people who don't understand them. And they are, again, definitely not finished yet, which means that you need to nurture them. And this is a complicated business to get from where you are to nurturing an idea to improving the future. We go back here for a second, then, into our pasts. And we draw my, my beautiful... Uh, my beautiful goldfish. There we go. Yep, beautiful goldfish. This is representative of human learning from errors. Has anybody here ever made a mistake? Ever? Have you ever made the same mistake twice? Yeah? And you've said to yourself, maybe you've written it in your beautiful moleskin journal, 
and you've written, I've done this before. I really should stop doing it. Have you ever married that person? <laughs> no? You know, because that's one definition of marriage, a series of one-night stands with a failure to learn, followed by more one-night stands and children, four. I'm very, very happily married, of course. This failure to learn means that experience, the things that happen to us, does not equal learning. We don't learn automatically from our experiences, and even when you learn a lesson, it doesn't mean you won't repeat the mistake. That's because we are habitual creatures governed by our habits, which includes your biology, it includes the culture that surrounds you. Many of you have your parents speaking in your head. You know, every now and then you hear your mother or your father speaking to you, saying something to you. Um, he'll never make anything of himself or something like that. I love him deeply. Habitual. So we are governed by our habits. We also are governed by heuristics. Heuristics in this means fast, frugal shortcuts that determine our behavior. And sometimes they're wrapped up in idioms. Uh, better late than never. Uh, look before you leap. Uh, better to have loved and lost than not to have loved at all. Now, those two, of course, are contradictory, aren't they? Which is why you go one night stand, failure to learn, I love her, I miss her, that kind of thing, over and over again. So you have heuristics, and then finally you have hypothesis. Humans can live by hypothesis. Now, the truth is that we live by a little bit of all of these things. Hypothesis means you seek experience to validate or invalidate your belief in the world. Has anybody ever wanted to visit a country that you have not yet visited? Yeah? For more than a year. Do you lack the money? Do you not have holidays? Why is it we don't even do the things we want to do to find out? You don't know. You live 30 or 40 years, you wish, you think that you'd be really happy if you're in the music industry in Barbados, only you work in the creative industry in Amsterdam. Or you really love the job that you have and you're, you're living perfectly. By hypothesis is how humans can live. And that's because we have something that other animals have less of. In fact, often not at all. We have these great big brains. And in those great big brains, I'll te test you. Tap your forehead with me for a second. Ta close your eyes, tap your forehead. I'll give you the finger. You'll never know I did it. <laughs> oh, the audience will. Oh, drat. <laughs> the, um, tap your, that's where you are. If I cut off your leg, you're still you. I cut off your arm, you're still you. If I lobotomize you, there's very little of you left. This is the thing. This little part of your brain. You know, it's all you, I suppose, but this is the bit that gets to do something remarkable. It gets to imagine. So one, it can imagine. Number one. Two, it can plan, plot, and delay. So it can imagine and it can plan, and it can also imagine what other humans will do. And this is pretty handy, because these humans can look forward to the future. Here's my future illustrated by a bottle, <laughs> which probably tells you more about me than I should be sharing. It's a bottle of uh, you know, a grey goose or something. And here's a message from the future. I can come forward to the future in my head and imagine 
how I will feel in the future when it catches up with me, and whether or not I will be happy with my choices. Now, it's an imperfect system, but what the evidence suggests is that if you cast your mind and your imagination forward, you see things rather differently. For instance, there will be more than one smoker in this audience. I'm assuming smokers. Let's just check. So what does it say on the packet? It says it will kill you. You will die in pain, alone, statistically. But because your future self is not very real to you, but your present self is very real to you, in that moment, you're kind to your present self by smoking because it takes away the worries and it's a good place to chat people up, both of those things, and get promoted, possibly. Your future self, though, if you cast your mind forward, you get to make choices that your future self would approve of. Now, I don't mean delaying forever, becoming a nun or a monk or something. You can uh, enjoy your satisfaction, but this is termed an active time orientation. And when people have an active time orientation, they're able to do this very, very clever trick. People back here, they sometimes suffer from either a negative view of the past, negative past, or a positive view of the past. Positive view of the past are a lot of those people who wish they were still living in it, even though it wasn't very good at the time which is terrific, because if you live to be old enough, now is the best moment of your life. <laughs> Just use memory to, to recast it, your memories. Um, but in the present, people can put off things that they really feel that they should be doing. I mean, exciting things, not just your taxes, because they either have a hedonic view of the present. Hedonic means there's nothing I can do about the future, so I might as well have a laugh tonight. The future doesn't really exist. My, third son, my second son, who's an expert in alcohol, is a hedonic person. He thinks nothing of the future, but his present is very good. Or you could be fatalist. You could feel there's nothing worth doing now because you cannot affect the future, even though experience says otherwise. And these kind of behaviors can affect not only individuals, but then the organizations and the societies that they are part of. So uh, we'll, we'll show how that, that works for a second. So as we, we move along in life, there are different waves of change. Some of these waves of change we're part of, some we ignore, and we're sort of stranded by. Each of these waves of human desire pass through fairly discernible stages. If we're talking about innovation, for instance, somebody has an idea, preceding the idea as an insight, then you make the thing work, then somebody makes it work properly, then everybody copies it, then eventually you change its color. This is the pink stage of all innovations. As soon as the iPhone went, um, went gold, you knew that there was a limit, perhaps, of the new ideas going into it. What's changed everything, including the color? So insight, idea, work properly, and copy. Everything goes through this. And it's powered, while we don't know which technology will work, or which function, or which brand will be successful, what we do know is that they will be powered by human desire. This is the constant, and in this case, usually, the human desire to communicate. Another one would be the human desire to travel, to move, it's a form of communication. What happens with each of these, these waves is that one idea competes with other ideas, and eventually there becomes a dominant design. A challenger idea. And the interesting thing with challenger ideas and dominant designs is that it doesn't matter what you think 
of the new dominant design, it's going to be successful anyway. My father used to watch a, a science program with me called Tomorrow's World. And on Tomorrow's World, they would show all sorts of incredible inventions. And he used to nudge me in the ribs. And he would say, Max, I invented that. And I would say, you didn't invent it. You thought of the idea. But his ideas would be something like, wouldn't it be good if we could travel faster? Which is not quite the same thing as gathering the know-how and the expertise and the supporters and getting it to market, is it? Not quite the same. So that's my dad, fantastic guy. And that's Elon Musk, a guy who actually makes stuff work. People who make things work the most change ideas, make them a reality. Usually people who are thinkers and doers in the same body. That's where it works best. That's Elon Musk can design his own car, then make it work properly. Uh, you have somebody like Zuckerberg who can have an idea for a hot or not style app for rating the hotness of his uh, fellow classmates at Harvard and then build it and then see what happens. When the doers and the thinkers are, are together, they usually make the, the biggest change. But the rest of us, it doesn't matter whether or not, it doesn't matter whether my father thinks an idea is a good idea or not, it matters who makes it work. Equally, when my father tells me that he wishes his grandchildren would send him more photos via email, and I tell him that they put their photos on Instagram, and he says they should change what they do to suit him, there is no way that this is going to work. His lack of understanding of the wave of communications is not going to change the wave of communication. It's bigger than him. It's huge. It's like the shark. It's going to eat him up. And he's a fantastic dad and everything. This is my shark. Little eyes and everything. This shark is still going to affect him. Now, in competitive terms, what we're trying to do is to move from our bloody little islands where we do our work. This is where everybody can do what you can do. Everybody. Everybody can do it. And everybody understands it. We're then trying to move to a, a more beautiful island over here. And this is where you have your classic USP. On an individual basis, this might mean that you're the only person who understands how to use this particular tool in your particular place of work, which means that you can't sack you because somebody needs you to do it. That's your typical USB. But everybody understands that it's probably a useful tool or useful function or useful service to offer. Everybody understands it. And then you're trying to move from there to this place. This is paradise. And on paradise, things are a little different because, first of all, you have a USB. You have something that only you can do. And secondly, only you or only a few people get it. But the customer loves it. When you get to paradise, this is a fantastic place to be because nobody's going to copy you because nobody sees why you're bothering. And any copies that there are will be shallow copies rather than deep copies. Shallow rather than deep. OK, so let, let's give you an example of how we could move towards this. When I was in Japan, I mentioned once already, I found some fantastic things. They're called alert pants. Alert pants. And they are underwear that is black when you are the right size. So when you are fit, they are black. And when you are fat, they turn blue. So, you can either wear your fat pants 
or you can wear your fit pants. A fantastic innovation. Clearly, you can see what I'm wearing. <laughs> the fat versus fit. In this case, it means future always tough versus getting to the future in time. If you get to the future in time with the skills and the functions and the way that you work together, you succeed in not only sort of strategically achieving your objectives, but you are adapted. And when you are adapted, all success is successful ad adaptation. All failure is failure to adapt. So an organization needs two things. It, it, well, it needs to be able to cast itself into the future it needs to push itself towards paradise, getting the things people care about and delivering the things that they love, but particularly delivering the things that other people don't understand. And you get there by getting to the future in time, and you get to the future in time by asking questions. Now, organizations are sort of divided in terms of behavior from people who love the mission of the organization and people who obey the rules. If you love the mission of your organization and you love the rules, hi, hi, you are a soldier. You say, yes, sir. How high? And they're very important people. But if actually you don't love the mission and you don't love the rules, you are <laughs> what we call a rebel. And they're very easy to spot. They have a, a little motto. And that's the motto that they have. They tend to work in tech support. <coughs> that's just a joke. <laughs> so rebels. Alternatively, you might really not care about your company at all. Uh, and yes, me too. These people, they don't care about your company, they don't care about the future, they just care about themselves and they just fit in. And alternatively, you have the last group, and these are the mavericks. These people love the mission, they really care about the mission, but they don't care about the rules. What they're saying all the time is, WTFN, why the not? They're driven by curiosity to explore. They're not doing it for the same reasons as anybody else. They're doing it to help the company. So over at Pixar, a company with an innovation culture, you'd probably agree. It's a good company. It's a creative company. They've done great work. When the, uh, Brad Bird proposed the plot for The Incredibles, he was told that it would cost too much money. He was told to go back. Because you remember they have all those humans in it. It's very complicated. They have lots of scenes in it. He was told to go back and to find a cheap way of doing it. And he said, give me the black sheep. Give me the rebels. Give me the mavericks. Give me the people who are headed out of the door. And I will make your film for the same budget as the previous easy films to make. And he collected these people together who cared about doing something great but also were willing to break the rules to get there. So when you want to get to some desirable end that has previously been viewed as impossible, or you are recovering from what we will call a WTF moment, the moment where all of your plans stop working, like every taxi firm in the world dealing with Uber, Instead of rejecting and denying change, minimizing it, attacking it, denying it, going mad, like every taxi firm who's told me in London that there's nothing good about Uber because they don't know how to, they don't know their way around London, as if there was no GPS in the world. You know, instead of going mad, you instead seize hold of it and say, we could do something, you know, let's do something ourselves. What if, what if? and you get to live by hypothesis. And it's when these mavericks get together in thinker and doer groups that great things happen, deliberate adaptation. So my example of this could be uh, back in ancient Greece, 
where somebody came up with the idea, he was a philosopher, and he came up with the idea of a, tele, um, of a telescope at the upper reaches of their society. Came up with the idea of a telescope, but he didn't know how to make anything. Maybe he was in marketing, that kind of thing. And down here were the people who knew how to do things. They were the glass makers. So we had a situation where the philosophers had the idea for a telescope. The glass makers could have built the telescope, but because they don't talk, because they don't respect each other, you have to wait 1,500 years for someone to make a telescope. And that's quite a delay to market, isn't it? Quite a delay. So if we take this all the way through, humans have the ability to imagine the future, to plan and delay. They have a theory of mind. But we all have different perspectives of the future and different skills. When you get these groups together and you quit denying what is possible, you get to be fit in time. It's the hugely important part of progress. And to illustrate this, just as one last moment, I shall get that person. Come and join me. Come and join me, yes. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> For what? Who knows? OK, so um, this is what I want you to remember. I want you to remember this acronym I've invented just for you. <laughs> OK, uh, this is, sorry, a, no, not for you. <laughs> a high understanding group. This is at the heart of organizational change. When thinkers and doers understand each other, you're close enough to give each other the resources and the insights and the skills that you need. And you'll remember this through this. So come here. OK. OK. Oh, Ooh, this, is not a hug. Uh, this is more than a hug. Oh, this is more than a hug yeah. I want you to remember it, at least for you, not the people watching. When you're this close, when you start to understand another person like this in the workplace. <laughs> Do I smell? Oh. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Just, that's very rude. <laughs> if you were my friend, obviously, I forgive you. <laughs> but you want to be this close. You want a high understanding group between the thinkers and the doers. You want to dance together. You know a little bit. And when you get high understanding groups, managers, marketers, engineers, you get these big progress, the sort of areas of progression. Who invented the light bulb? Anyone know? The answer is not Edison. <laughs> Who invented the, I, the MP3 player? The answer, of course, is not Steve Jobs. So on and so forth. It's people down here who come up with these insights, and when they connect to people up here and they speak the same language, we really have the breakthroughs that have made our society work. Thank you for my hug. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> and for the feedback. Uh, <laughs> so we want to learn through hypothesis, through actually testing and exploring, deliberately getting in touch with our future selves to make better and better choices in the now. Thank you very much for your time.